thank you for coming in the rain and in the cold, and I'm very happy to see you here. And today we have a special event, don't we, with Steve Sabella. Um, and he's going to read from his memoirs, which were just published, and he's going to have a conversation with Siba Dabba. So let me start by introducing the both of them. Steve Sabella is a Palestinian photographic artist and writer. Sabella's art work is exhibited and held in collections around the world. He holds a BA in Visual Studies from the State University of New York, an MA in Photographic Studies from the University of Westminster, and an MA in Art Business from the Sotheby's Institute of Art. In 2008, he received the Ellen Auerbach Award from the Académie der Kunst in Berlin, which included the publication of his monograph by Hatia Kunz. Uh, Steve has been based in Berlin since 2010. The first limited edition of the Parachute Paradox, which you see there, uh, his memoir in English was released by a German art publisher Kerber Verlag in September 2016. He returns to London after his most recent solo exhibition here, Fragments at the Berloni Gallery in 2014. And he's here today to launch his memoirs at SOAS. So that's Steve. And Siba Dabba completed her PhD earlier this year at SOAS. She is interested in objects, words, and images in the literatures and visual arts of the Arab and Turkish Middle East, as well as patronage of visual arts and literary practices. In her writing, she looks at the role of memory as a part of resistance strategies in contemporary visual arts and literatures, which focus on Iraq and Palestine. Steve, Steve Sabella is an important part of her research. Siba is also a senior teaching fellow at SOAS. She teaches MA Palestine uh, MA Palestine, Modern Palestinian Literature, and BA Nation and Nationalism in Middle Eastern Fiction. She convenes the MA Critical Perspectives on Palestine Studies and will teach classes on the visual arts and museology of Palestine next term. So please help me welcome the two of them. Thank you for coming to London, and Steve. It's great Pleasure. to see you again, and it's an interesting experience for me to read you after reading your images. Um, so it's interesting as a shift to see your visual art, to look at your documentaries, and then now to read um, your memoir. And I think one of the most important, the, the first questions that I have for you is what instigated you to write? I mean, mm. you create images, what? but why yeah. have you decided to create what? words this time? True. I don't see so much difference between what I do in writing or using visual art, per se. I just took the challenge to create images using words. So I wanted the words to create images, per se. And I think somehow it worked. I enjoyed the process. Why I wanted to write this book? I mean, I always say, people tell me you're so young. Why are you writing your memoirs? And I always say, I wanted to write this book 20 years ago. I'm late, like almost 20 years. So I had a lot to say when I was young, given the place where I grew up. It's never easy. So. I was aware of the situation a long time ago, living under Israel occupation and what it means. And I wanted to say something about it. And it took me 30, probably six years or seven to start. I thought I'm going to finish this book in three months. It took three years. <laughs> long time. Yeah. Um, so the genre that we're reading this is a genre of memoirs. So mm. <clears throat> rather than a genre of autobiography okay. or anything else. So. Um, I wanted to ask on page 141, for those of you that want to buy the book later, there's an interesting moment when you're describing the story of Charlie, Charlie Saka, yeah. and um, how he was resisting the fighting and the symbol that his home had for him, yeah. and how he seems to be this symbol of resistance, I think, um, in that particular moment of your memoir. And it just made me think, um, we, we read this as being the memoir of Steve Sabella, yeah. but we also have the memoirs of many other Palestinian figures. And I wanted to ask you, is this just purely your, your memoir? Are we supposed to be reading these as only your memoirs, or also the yeah. memoirs of other Palestinians? I wouldn't say memoirs for other people. I would say their stories. And I only wrote about people who I know, whose stories I'm familiar with. So they became part of my life. And I had to you ask me why, for example, I choose to write about this man. I mean, it's one story, but speaking about you tell one story, you can, by default, you will understand many others. 
um, like also people assume, I want to say, memoir, it's about facts. I mean, let's define what the fact is. The, the memoir blends reality and imagination almost on equal level. Mm -hmm. So you question, is this for real? Can this happen in real life? And I leave it up to you to decide, but I can tell you one thing, there is a truth in every word I wrote. So that means that for you, memoir is just, it's a genre, but you're also questioning this, the it's, truth yeah. element of it. Well, and then the second argument I get, how can you write anything without imagination? So mm -hmm. imagination is a key ingredient in writing. There is no, you can't be creative if you don't have imagination, but you, to, to write a memoir, you have to be very creative. So you have to resort to the imagination. So that imagination is supposed to be fiction. Mm -hmm. So now, where is, what is fiction, what is reality? It's something to think about. Mm -hmm. um, but the imagination that you are writing yeah. about is that communicated in English. So I yeah. want to ask you, why did you choose to write in English? Because throughout the memoirs, yeah. you're always talking about this conflict that you're having with your daughter. Yeah. When you are in Palestine, you speak to when you are in Israeli malls, you yeah. make sure that nobody speaks in he in yeah. Arabic yeah. because you feel the, the system makes you feel ashamed yeah. to be speaking in Very Arabic. Much so. And there are other moments where. Yeah. It's so important for you to know how to speak Arabic, like when you were um, um, when you were kidnapped. There yeah. is that moment when you're working for the UN. So I want you to talk a little bit about the choice of language. Why did mm. you choose to write in English? Where why are there no moments of Arabic except one one particular letter which you reproduce <laughs> with the Arabic script and then the sure. English translation? So can you speak a little bit about the choice of language? Yeah, here? we can speak a lot about this. I mean, I went first of all to a private school in Jerusalem. So let's blame the school first. <laughs> They're not writing Arabic. So they care about the English language and not about the Arabic. And yet, it's not a native English speaking school per se. So you, you grow having a language which is not really 100%. So I, ne I don't feel like I speak Arabic 100% or Hebrew or 100% or English or French. And yet, I manage to function with language. Mm -hmm. So the question is if I speak English in the house with my partner, and then we have a daughter, I mean, she is from Switzerland originally. So she speaks with German and I speak broken English. So, and then what is the girl gonna listen to broken English? And that becomes a native English language. So now- but why, why, uh, why can't she speak broken English? I mean, you it's mentioned It's fine, that's what I was to say. I'm going with this. The um, language becomes very funny then. What is language? It's about communication. End of the story. You can use the syntax any way you want. I have, I created my own syntax. It's fantastic, so why not? So I make, <laughs> it becomes more artistic. Um, what I wanted to ask about, Arabic, of course I want to write in Arabic. If I knew how to write in Arabic, I know, of course, how to write, but how to make it sound like melody, that's difficult. That's why I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. But as a language, I love the language from A to Z. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the most beautiful on earth. But unfortunately, I'm not fortunate enough to be able to write in Arabic. Mm -hmm. I wish I could. Yeah. Did the, did the market have a play a role in this at all? Your audience, your readership? Not at all. Were English is the language I function with all mm -hmm. my life, so that's why I write in English. Okay. Um, so, I really want to talk a little bit about the, the political aspects of your memoir. Yeah. Everything that you say has always had a political side to it. Okay. And there was one moment on page 62 where you're talking about um, not being able to go into clubs in Israel and having to take on this Israeli persona, mm -hmm. um, speaking in Hebrew in order to get access to these spaces of exclusivity. Um, and you said on page 62, parties or any kind of fun were seen as distraction from the national struggle. Mm -hmm. So your art is so much about the national struggle in, in, a, in a sense. I mean, you, whenever you're describing yeah. your artworks, there's always a, an element of politics yeah. there. And so I thought this distinction between having fun and the national struggle, that made me think about your own practice as an artist. Is yeah. there no element of fun there? Or is there any other way to read your, your memoirs, your documentaries. I mean, that's one, let's just be clear. If you choose to see it this way, that's your perspective, and which is 100% legitimate. When mm -hmm. I look at my book, I have multi it in different ways so that mm -hmm. there can be different readings. Otherwise, there is no point. Now, definitely there is the political aspect in the book, mm -hmm. but you can also see the book as speaking about many other things in life. Mm -hmm. And it's up to the reader to project whatever he or she wants to see in the book. Um, in, in many ways, I copied the way I create my art into writing, meaning I work with fragments in my collages, as you remember. Mm -hmm. And then layers, like vertical and horizontal and deep. And then I put them together. Mm -hmm. And the same thing I want you to do with the book, is write in fragments and make these layers, you know, because cross reference to some story. Mm -hmm. And it's inevitable that they will be seen in many different ways, because nobody can see collage 
in one way. You will see microlenses in a different way. Definitely, you will see a different. And this, I think, I'll try to adopt the same concept for the book. I hope it works. I did get the sense of collaging yeah. and bit of there were snip, snippets that I had yeah. read before or seen before. Like you have your 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 um, Ted Ted Marrakesh yeah. talk, and there was there is a moment in in your memoirs where it's almost a, a replication of that. And so is that part of the collage yeah. that you're trying to create? That you're what? picking out moments where your yeah. audience are you expecting your audience to have what to have watched that YouTube that that clip on YouTube, but also on TED? No, I don't or expect it. But what I did was for sure I, that TED talk inspired me how to write uh, the book. Because there in my TED talk I gave I spoke very quickly about the core issues, what needs to be done, and I said it with clarity. I said if I manage to do that in text with 300 pages, <laughs> then it's a success story. So I wanted to go straight and to the point. And how you can say this in 15 minutes or in a short story. The fact is this book changed title. Before it was called The Artist Curse. And I wanted to write about something about the art world. But to get there, I needed to deal with this first. And then I decided these are two books. So let's deal with what I wanted to say here. So to move on, basically, the concept of liberation and continuous in, in other forms. Would you like to read a little bit for us? If you want to listen. <laughs> <laughs> I think we will want to Okay, I'll read the prologue, the first two pages, to start with. Okay? And just this way people just anticipate what the book is about. Well, when I got home, I raced against time to pack and get to Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv. I was exhausted and dreaded the usual three hours of questioning and interrogation by Israel Airport Security. Shalom, Meir Fuata. Hello, where are you from? In a Hebrew accent, while gargling the air in Yerushalayim, I said, Anim Yerushalayim, I come from Jerusalem. She continued, where exactly do you come from? If I answered with East Jerusalem, it would be assumed I was an Arab, and if I answered with West Jerusalem, it would be assumed I was Jewish. I replied, Antonia Street, Old City. She checked my passport, but my place of origin was still not clear to her. She asked me for my father's name, Emile, your mother's Esperance, your grandfather's Anton. What's the origin of the name Sabella, Italian? Do you celebrate Hanukkah? Why not? Do you celebrate Christmas? Sure. She was hesitant and she was hesitant to ask if I was an Arab or Palestinian Arab. To speed things up, I told her I came from Jerusalem, the Arab one. All I wanted was to board the plane and close my eyes. What is your occupation? Artist. I also work as a photographer for the UN. I showed her my press card. Where were you before you arrived at the airport? I couldn't tell her I had just been kidnapped in Gaza. She would consider it a security threat and definitely not allow me to board the plane in Jerusalem. And why are you going to Switzerland? To have a holiday with my wife and daughter. My wife is Swiss. Why are you traveling alone? Why do you work for the UN? Have you traveled to Gaza with the UN? Why do you live in Jerusalem? Why don't you live in Switzerland? When did your family settle in Jerusalem? Why is your name Steve? The questions were endless and the first security guard was replaced by a second, and the second by a third, until the chief of security was called. I kept repeating the same narrative again and again. I had to be consistent and not make any mistakes. Listen to me. This is my story. No matter how long you interrogate me, it will not change. Either you let me go home to Jerusalem, or you let me board the flight, let's get it over with. They gave in allowed me to board after a conspicuous back check and a full body search, escorted me to the plane like a VIP, and finally left me. I found my seat, sat down, and leaned back to close my eyes for the first time two days. But every time I heard the click of a seatbelt, I woke up startled. It sounded like the cocking of the kidnappers' guns. I opened my restless eyes and spotted a man watching me. He was black, and I imagined for a moment that he was the man the kidnappers released that morning. When he noticed that I spotted him, he unbuckled his seatbelt, walked over, and sat down on the aisle seat next to me. He spread open a newspaper and pointed to a photograph. Is this you? 
It showed a woman and me with guns all around us. And the bold title read, UN workers freed in Gaza. I burst into laughter and said, sometimes the answer is right there in front of you. Up in the air, I traveled to the time I went skydiving in Haifa. On the tarmac, the plane looked it hadn't flown since the 1967 war. After takeoff, the engine roared as if it could fail any second, shaking wildly as if it reached, as it reached the sky. When the time came, I unbuckled my seatbelt and leaned out of the open door against a strong wind. Without much thought, I did it. I let go. I was flying in the air. I felt light, less burdened by what was happening below. I felt identityless, free from all the labels and classifications, free from all the racism and discrimination, free from the Israeli occupation I was born into. But I didn't open the parachute. I was in a tandem jump attached to an Israeli. Over the years, I've come to see this situation in the air as a metaphor for what it means to be a Palestinian living under Israeli occupation. Life under occupation is like the reality of a Palestinian attached to an Israeli in a tandem jump. There is an Israeli on the back of every Palestinian, controlling all aspects of life. The Israeli is always in control. This impossible reality places the Palestinian under constant threat in a never-ending hostage situation. On the ground, I struggled with paralyzing depression that sank to new lows year after year. But I knew my journey would have been one of self-interrogation and liberation. With the speed of the fall, I felt Francesca's presence. Over the years, we had built our own world based only in our imagination. Only there were we able to find our own freedom. Thank you very much. So this idea of the parachute and yeah. you're not opening the parachute is something that is consistent throughout your memoir, this, this paradox here. Yeah. Um, and there are so many sentences that are just yeah. so paradoxical, almost oxymoronic in yeah. a sense. I mean, you say so many times, this is what I remember, but the images have a memory of their own, so yeah. the fact that memory, memories are um, subjective. Or later on, on page 163, you say, it took me a long time to forget this story, and yet I can still find it in the pages of my memory. Yeah. And so this paradox of you trying to forget, and it's going to take you a long time, but you will still forget, yeah. and then you still find it in the pages of your memory. So how do these, how do you reconcile these contradictory, yeah. oxymoronic um, Well, there are many things here. to speak about. You asked me many things, so I need to focus on <laughs> Let's talk about maybe the last thing I remember. Um, about forgetting a memory. I mean, you realize if you live in exile, I mean, I saw myself living in exile while living in Jerusalem. I mean, that's how atrocious it is. Imagine when I came to London, so I felt double elimination, like in real exile and in a hyper city. But then you realize the only way out is not to forget your past. You know, you can't forget the past. The only way to move forward is to come to terms with the past. And I was going through this process and then reading Willem Flusser, the philosopher. And he says, he's a Jewish, also uh, who lived uh, in the Czech and then moved, and he felt in exile, and then he liberated himself from exile. And he says, exilees become free, not when they deny their homeland, but when they come to terms with it. With this what I did. I sat down and went through the files of my life, page by page, with every story, even stories that I wanted to forget. Because I, you know, when you witness war, I mean there are many stories you want to forget. And, but how, how do you move on? So that's one aspect of your answer. And why the paradoxes? I mean, I do believe we live in an impossible reality in Palestine. Truly impossible. And yet, but I believe that if human beings are able to create structures, then we have the power to unstructure or destructure whatever we have created. So there is the possibility, and then I realized, wait a second, things can be so. Who's convinced us so much that this occupation is forever, or states are forever? No state is forever. So when I realized that consciously, it, it helped me liberate myself more and more. Because if there is one overused word uh, you hear in Jerusalem, is the eternal, for example. You know, eternal capital, eternal this, eternal that. That's quite something. Uh, paradox, it is the land of all paradoxes. Doesn't, it's the land where nothing makes sense. Why nothing's being solved? Okay, so you, if you think sometimes I use language to mirror paradox, why not? I mean, it, I want it to mirror the reality on the ground. 
it's an unbelievable reality, and we have to fix it. That's why I turned this reality into visual dilemma, and that's why where the imagination blends with the reality. And once I solve my visual dilemma, you know, put the code in a different way, I free myself. Um, let's say you mentioned about sentence drowning in the air. Uh, why, how you drowning there? I mean, it's the, in this, it's the same way Gaza, they tell you Gaza, uh, people are freeing Gaza and the living freedom, and we're actually able to be controlled on the side. Are you kidding me? I mean, the fact that you breathe air, you walk on the street, you're not free. There is total control. So this is not freedom, that's actually a giant prison. So I can drown in the air and still feel suffocating, or, oh no, sorry, drown in the air and, and think it's uh, water or, or not feel free, it's fine. So the dive of freedom is actually wasn't the dive of freedom. It was connected to another reality, being hostage to an Israeli of my, of my life. But it's interesting you say that this is, you know, being confined to spaces, something particular to living in an occupied space. Yeah. But in your memoir, you also talk about your experiences in London. Yeah. And you were equally claustro feeling claustrophobic mm -hmm. with your family living at Good Enough College. The rooms were so small. Mm -hmm. uh, the flat, the apartments were really, really tiny. Yeah. And you were going from one space to another. So that made me think. Could we see this idea of claustrophobia and confining and ex spaces of exclusivity as being particular to Palestine or Israel, or is that something more of a universal condition mm. that human beings are feeling frustrated because they have no yeah. space to reflect yeah. and be creative? Okay. I mean, first of all, I do speak about my own experiences. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do not. I am, as I say in the book, I'm not an ambassador to Palestine by any means, so to anyone. I present my own views. So I, these are my stories. So you ask me if this can, if other people feel the same. I mean, I'm, I don't think I should answer this. But what I tell you in London, definitely I, because London is that kind of city that attracts people from all over the world. If there is this sense of alienation in London, because these people who live in London, they neither somehow feel home at here or. They can't even go and dip back home. They can't stand back home, but they want to live here, but yes and no. So there's a form of alienation. And then a few years ago, I wrote alienation as the new world syndrome, because maybe it's time we uproot ourselves and re-understand what home is and where home is. Is home is the place where you were born? Yeah, what do you consider as home? I mean, I can say it in maybe another way. If I would, if I would have lived in Jerusalem 20 years, 20 years in London, 20 years in Moscow, okay? I can understand where I was born 100% that I'm from Jerusalem, you know, left 20 years. But those 20 years in London also count, they are, you know. And then the 20 years in Moscow also count. So this is, that's why I'm thinking our understanding of home totally changes. Is that why you want to rediscover Jerusalem, as you say, towards the end of your memoir? Yeah. To say, I thought collaborating on this project with Giano would allow me to rediscover Jerusalem. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm very familiar with your visual work, so maybe you'd like to mm. you know, explain a little bit to the audience who aren't so familiar. What, what do you mean by rediscovering? How do you re rediscover? A, a I went to my place of birth. That's why, that's why I said you need to go to the core issue. And for me to fix whatever I wanted to fix, you know, and me, I needed to go to all the places that maybe I, sh I, I, I tried not to go to. Mm -hmm. uh, I was doing an artwork with uh, I was doing an artwork, but I didn't do it with Geno, but the idea started uh, with Geno working together about something. But then I, that project became radically different. Anyway, I collected wall plaster, paint, peeling paint from Jerusalem's old city walls. And the process itself, you know, imagine this paint is peeling, and old city has a lot of old walls. And they had to peel it very carefully. And I peeled hundreds of fragments, put them between glass sheets, and transported them to London and to Berlin. Uh, of course, many of them broke because they are so fragile. But I, in the book, I say, I start while peeling, as if you're peeling the onion. You peel, peel until there is nothing. This means you solved the issue. So I was peeling and putting, attaching a metaphor to the fragments that they should mean this, this, and that. So while doing the process slowly, you know, you reflect, you process, and then you find your own answers. And it worked for me. I mean, is it good? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I want to go a little bit talk about the art historical aspect. Yeah. You describe a lot of your your visual art practices and the yeah. reasons that motivated you to create them. And there is that the peeling um, Kanye Matan you talk about, yeah. and you know, so many other series. But 
I think it's so interesting. There is only one actual visual representation, and I'm not quite sure if, if it's actually related to, to your words, but you've got visual breaks. The asteroids. Um, I mean, the, the, not the asteroids, sorry, the stars. Yes. Up the so, of the stars. so instead of having stars yeah. or breaks, you have these roots. Is that related to your visual? Yeah, euphoria. Yeah. I, I, I told the designer I wanted to take a form from my, from my work, and she took a small piece which works. So Why did you not include actual images of your work? Impossible, because it only, should only be text. I wanted, as I said, the text to create images. Uh, if I would have put images, the book would fail 100%. You also have. I want the imagination to uh, create everything that you can, not uh, feed you with the visual. This how it looks in the short. Then you develop, you know, a reaction. I don't want the reaction. I want the reaction to happen. The words. <laughs> That's interesting because you have other works. Yeah. Where it's just the visual image without. Which without I don't want text there. I took all my texts. Like I did the other process. Like in my last exhibitions, 2014, all the solos, I mm -hmm. went by the museum show in London, Bergoni, and then uh, Kuwait and Dubai. I said I don't want any text. I took all text because I didn't want to contaminate the visual with text. Mm -hmm. I want people to look at art because it's visual. How Do many you times think that they cannot interact with one another? Actually, they could. I mean, we are all different. Separate. But all I'm saying, we're all different when it comes to this. But there, I think there is a point. In what way are we different? Uh, no, I mean, many, or more, probably 99% of the museums and galleries, they want to have text that tell you something about the work, mm -hmm. correct? The, and the first thing people look for is the text. Now, for the love of God, I mean, see the art first and then see the text. It's secondary. Mm -hmm. Right? The text is secondary. Mm -hmm. I'm not there to read text, I'm there to look at art. So I took all the text out and it works like magic. It freed the art from any narrative. So here, yeah. the narrative is being freed of the art. Oh, the probably, yes. Image. I, 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 maybe I, I may, if I may continue, <coughs> I did divorce myself from my narrative. And what happened? I freed my art from my narrative. So that the art can have different lives and can be looked at in many different ways. In the past, I might have narrowed its meaning because I had to, and you grow as an artist, as a person. And I realized that take out, get rid of the text, and let the art speak for itself. And there, it has endless stories. Because I'm not positioning, I'm not uh, forcing you to read it in a certain way. I think you have another piece promised for us. Okay. Well, I'm so thirsty. <laughs> we have a reception later yeah. on, so please do join us for that. Uh, okay. Two. Okay, sorry. In many ways, Palestinians did wait for negotiations, inscribed and signed in ink to feel free. But the Oslo One Accord, with its many signatures, brought unprecedented segregation to Palestine, imprisoning and fragmenting the society. Instead of bringing peace, it brought misery. Palestinians failed to liberate Palestine with armed force, peace talks, or even the throwing of stones, the weapon of choice during the first intifada. In my opinion, the struggle shifted from one of liberating the land to one of freeing the occupied body. Eventually, Palestinians felt they had nothing to lose. When their voices were repeatedly ignored or dismissed, they doomed suicide they don't suicide vests and root themselves up in Israeli cafes and restaurants. But no matter what people did to achieve independence, Israel kept the upper hand and controlled life, always finding a way to put the blame on the other side, always finding ways to tighten the ropes on the Palestinian in the tandem job. Israelis came up with endless excuses to justify the occupation of Palestine. Their consecutive governments, right or left, occupied more land, built walls, imprisoned and tortured people, including children, and literally stripped Palestinians down to their underwear. Since 1948, Israel has spoken and exercised the language of war while convincing the world it was fighting for peace. Israel kept dealing with the side effects of the problem rather than ending what triggered it. The only solution was to go back to the core, to the essence of the conflict, the occupation. If you allow me, I want to say something small. It's unbelievable how many people justify the occupation. Because just the occupation cannot be justified. Period. I give the example I, I repeat in every talk. I may mean, it's necessary to say it again because every time it's a new audience. Rape, for example. Can anyone justify rape? Can you be friend? Can you become friends with anyone who justifies rape? 
if you become friends with such a person. There's something wrong <laughs> in the mind. Rape cannot be justified, period. I think something else is going to be justified. Torture. It can be. And you can, yeah, I can't become friends with someone who justifies torture. The third thing, slavery. We can all agree on planet Earth that slavery cannot be justified, period. And one more thing cannot be justified. The op occupying people. The land of Palestine is not fully occupied. It's the people on the land who are really occupied. So for me, anyone who justifies the occupation is like someone who justifies rape. And from here, we have a huge problem. Because in Israel, there are so many people, unbelievable number, who justify their occupation. I only met in my life, and I'm 41 years old, one Israeli who did not justify the occupation by any means. Only one. And I would have made his story in this book, but it didn't. The fragment did not sit right, <laughs> and they would not tell me shit. Only one. And that is a shocking figure. And I'm a person who speaks with Israelis, with Palestinians. I have Israeli friends. You can't imagine. But there's always the but, you know? Mm -hmm. The but. You have the series yeah. Settlement, the one yeah. that I, I focused a lot on in, yeah. my, um, in my research, and we talked about it a lot, but it'd be nice for the audience to yeah. hear as well. Um, you talk about the Israelis forcing Palestinians to pull down their trousers yeah. and stay in their, in their underwear, and that's exactly what you did. Yeah. And you say that, you know, on the other hand, you only met one Palestinian, yeah. one Israeli, sorry, that hasn't justified the occupation and completely yeah. against it. So well, what about those, see it as those six Israelis who you did manage to Well, uh, well first of all, we're a conversation to start with. I mean, I, when I, I looked for Israelis, they all even served in the army to do this project, to strip their underwear. Six, and I'll be facing them on the other side, also straight to my own. But, I mean, I put some of the talks, the dialogues I had uh, with several, and you can tell a bit about the mentality. I'm not saying they are, you know, if you speak with them, and I respect all of them, they're all my friends. They're all anti the they, they would anti the occupation and, uh, and everything, but you all, but for example, when Norman Finkelstein came to, to the college, good enough college, it's a postgraduate house and sometimes they invite speakers. Almost all the Israelis worked in sync to block him. I mean, the man <laughs> is not saying anything wrong. And I do mention Norman finished in my book, and I do feel I'm so much like him. I'm definitely not anti-Israel, and I'm for sure not pro-Palestine. I'm pro-justice, period. And from here we start. And you can only claim maybe such a statement, because I managed to uproot myself and on my route to become, you know, of becoming a global citizen. And then you start to look at things from different perspectives. And there is no way to look at the situation that's happening there except that it's really wrong. So, because of that, because of your strong stance yeah. towards justice, how are you perceived in Israel as, a, as an artist? Uh, of I have no idea. You go ask. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever exhibited? I mean, people are different. In the beginning, you know, when I studied, I studied Israeli school photography. Um, the f I only, when I did my school, so I probably had an exhibition in Tel Aviv and somewhere else in Jerusalem. But uh, that's it, it ended, I think, after 1998 or 2000. I, I chose not to exhibit because, you know, I also grew up, I gained more awareness where I am, where I come from, what I'm dealing with, and I chose not to exhibit in Israel. And I still, Why not? I still do. Why? Why not? Now you have a new museum, right? Museum of Palestine. That's in Palestine. <laughs> Palestine. <laughs> Palestine. Would you yeah. exhibit I there? I dare 100%, of course, with pleasure and honor. And you ask me why I would not exhibit in Israel, because it's, uh, you have to deal with people. Uh, I know probably their essence, they justify the occupation. So it's either I have to know 100% their morals are mm -hmm. clean. Are you not just assuming then? Maybe, maybe. Why don't you challenge yourself? I can, I don't know. I would always do. I mean, I got maybe an invitation from uh, some museum in Berlin that I don't want to say now anything about it, that Palestinians probably would not exhibit it. I will, I will think about it because at the end of the day, I, what is freedom, right? Mm -hmm. I have to believe in my own statements, mm -hmm. but I choose who to work with, and that makes also a difference. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, one thing I thought was absolutely interesting when you're searching for houses and places to stay with Francesca, and you're moving through different cities, navigating your way, trying to find this dream home, and you mentioned mm. exactly his dream home, dream home on page 142. You're constantly searching for a dream home, I think, um, or a dream space. Yeah. We see it in London, in Jerusalem, in, in Berlin. What does space mean? What is your dream home? Uh, it's funny. Can you describe it? Yeah. Dream you? home? I, it's, um, 
Uh, I, I was, I, I think I was very blessed in my life because in the old city, I don't know, Brian, have you been to my house, the old city? Yeah? Is it a beautiful space? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> yeah, we had a beautiful space in the old city. And then I, I uh, refurbished the house and I even of more time. Uh, I have an issue with space. It has, uh, how maybe given that my personal space was locked, so I looked for a space that I feel good in. And that's not easy to find, but I was blessed to find it more than once. Twice in Jerusalem, definitely not London. <laughs> maybe that's why I was not over here. <laughs> and in Berlin. Uh, and the stories are sometimes quite funny how they happen, almost like imagination. And I don't know if we, the talk leads us to speak about uh, image and imagination, because I do believe that reality and imagination are two sides of the same coin. And that's why many people question what are these stories true? What are the chances that some of them happen? I mean, you know the story also, meeting the guy from uh, Tunis, mm -hmm. Paris. Yes, yes, yes. That was also weird. Yes, I thought that. There are many moments where yeah. you meet very important people. Ehud Barak, yeah. I think, right? Ehud yeah. Barak as well. Barak, Barak in the hotel, yeah. talking, and I thought, yeah. is this guy for real? I never, I never heard you mention them before, and yeah. so I thought, are these? How are we supposed to be reading them? This is your memoir. Do you I know? don't know. I mean, I'm just uh, writing what, I'm, what I saw. What do you I remember? Do you imagine what you remember? Well, it, I read once in a book, uh, in a greater book. There is no way you can write without imagination. Like it's forget it. It's like there, there is, there is. How I, I don't know how he said it. He said, "Is it real? Is it close enough?" Mm -hmm. Like in the memoir, it's close enough. It, mm -hmm. it can always be close enough. Mm -hmm. Memory has its own uh, twists. So maybe you met somebody that looked a little bit like. No, no, it's not. That's definitely him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think you have one last bit. Yeah. Right. Or shall we open it up for a discussion? You can ask any questions. I mean, if you are curious, if anyone has a question, we can ask. I know I can... Uh, Save the best for the... For no, we, if you only want... It's easier because yeah. we... Does anybody want to ask questions now? Or shall we listen to him first? Whatever you'd like. Anything? Why don't... Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I have some questions for you anyway. Actually, I missed uh, one, one that continues the other one. Okay, I don't want to go that because I already said this sometimes. It's just really yeah. Okay. I sat down in 2012. <laughs> I sat down and sifted through each and every page in the file of my past. When I was done, I stitched my wounds with barbed wire. In a few months, all the poison dripped out of my body. I came to terms with my history. I found a life between euphoria and melancholia, between exile and home. I am the only one who can be the source of my energy. As a child, I pointed a flashlight into the well of my old city house. Today, I look into the dark well of my life and see my light mirrored back. Every time I fall into the darkness, my darkness, I remind myself that liberation comes through the search for inner light. No one to fool you otherwise. There is a moment when I was in Croatia where Cecilia, my daughter, was in the lake swimming with Francesca. In my moment of serenity, I watched Francesca and Cecilia in the water and felt the bliss of their presence. Just then, Cecile turned into me and said, imagine if it was the other way around, that dreams were reality, and reality was a dream. I mean, it took me a few sentences to get what she wants to say there, and I asked her, what do you mean by this? Imagine if it was the other way around, that dreams were reality, and reality was a dream. And this inspired me to finish my book with the voice of my daughter. When Cecile and I talk, we often start our thoughts with, imagine. For many years, my life was held hostage by Israeli occupation, but in my dreams, I was free. Once I learned how to change my own consciousness, my dreams became my reality. I was born under Israeli occupation, but found a way to live free. As for liberating the land of Palestine, 
I leave it to our collective imagination. I think I'm going to open it up to the audience to ask some questions on this one. I'm chair, but you know, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to ask you. And I'm going to start from backward, from the very last sentence you just said, that uh, occupation and freedom. So in a sense, you know, um, I want to use this to bring in the paradoxical discourses that you have throughout whether you're speaking or whether you're writing. And this is the idea of being shackled, imprisoned by reality, situation, and the ability to sort of like transcend that, yeah. and move in the realm of imagination or dream, as you said, and find freedom. But I suppose that the question is really, are you sure about this? Uh. Uh, and I, I'm going to ask you that, you know, what is home for you? Yeah. What is home? It's not homeland. I can answer that. I can answer both. The first one was, if it, if it works, you want to say? Is it? Yeah. Have you really I, found your freedom? Yeah, I, I want to say, you know, when I wrote this book, it's not important that people, um, they have to, what I want to maybe say in other words, people have to feel that I feel it happened to me. And mm -hmm. if I manage to convey that feeling, then you will believe that it's true. I totally feel that in a way for myself. And anyone who knows me from years ago, even though probably I was the most pragmatic person and free person ever, Imagine, even I found residue of occupation in my veins, and I felt entrapped. But I really feel liberated, and I'm very happy. I feel like, it's great. I mean, <laughs> it's all. That's one. And the second part was home. What do you mean by liberation? liberation. Yes, yeah, so what, what do you mean by liberation? Liberation, I mean, you talked about when you feel liberation controlled. of the land of Palestine. No, I feel liberation of the self. This is of why. Self. So yeah. Does that mean that you're no longer preoccupied with I know. It's like, I, I feel, like, because the book speaks about the colonization of the imagination. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, this is the secret form that not many people are aware of. You know, you can occupy the land, that's obvious. But what is more dangerous is when you occupy people's minds. Uh, I really believe that we live in a system that wants to tell you how to live, how to smell, how to look, how to think, and worst of all, how to imagine. So our collective imagination on planet Earth is contaminated, has been controlled to the extreme. To the extreme. We all fell, fall victim to this in everywhere. And in my case, I'll speak about one form, which is in Jerusalem, you know, Palestine and the occupation of the mind. So basically, I, I, I use a metaphor, it's like a virus injected into your mind when you are born, that you are under occupation, period. Mm -hmm. And no matter what you do, on planet Earth, you will always be occupied. I'll give you an example. I met once a Palestinian in Dubai who has never set foot in Palestine. And while speaking with her, I get the sense she feels living under Israeli occupation. So I asked myself, I asked her, why do you feel you live under occupation? You don't live there. You live obviously in New York and Dubai. Where is this sense of occupation coming from? And she suddenly woke up. I woke her up to realize that, yes, you're right. I thought that the land of Palestine is occupied, not your mind. So the system works for the Palestinian, wherever the Palestinian lives. It's quite something to think about. So it made my, uh, my thesis statement clearer and clearer. So what we have to fight for is how to gain back our imagination. So uh, if anything, I think the book brings back agency to the self and to the imagination. Mm -hmm. And once the mind is liberated, everything else is possible. So in, in a sense, you know, push this further, home can be anywhere. It exactly. doesn't have to be. I want to exactly answer this. I, I know exactly where I come from. I'm very proud of where I come from. From Jerusalem, old city, and I can be even more specific from about Bab Hatta Now, as but you travel, sorry, Bab Hatta. You mentioned Bab Hatta, yeah. and you, you say that you, you actually went to um, an administrative yeah. office to, to get a change because it's associated yeah. with a poorer class. So yeah. right now you feel very proud of it, of but then. Yeah. There are moments where you it's not about poorer class. Change. It's not about poorer class. I just I think it's like the melody of the words. I'm, mm. I'm picky about uh, you know, these things in life. Mm. I like a certain form of aesthetic. So I just think like it. And then I realized, my God, I'm very proud of where I come from. And it's funny because when I was kidnapped, they asked me where I come from. I, and my ID card said Antonia Street because I changed it from a Pata, not an Arabic name. So they couldn't believe that I come from an Arabic neighborhood. That's a story maybe to me. But I wanted to maybe just to continue what is home. Uh, no, when I say I uprooted myself from the ground, and then I took my roots and uh, planted them in the air, in the clouds. Why in the clouds? To always remain in transition, free. Home is where I wanted to be. I feel extremely at home in Berlin. 
like you can't imagine. Okay, home is where Francesca and Cecilia are. You know, we create our own home, my, my immediate family. Wherever they are, I feel at home with them. And that's a great sense of being and living, not to torture the self with, you know, uh, belonging and not belonging. I mean, these are all residues of probably, uh, I want to say, nationalism and, I don't know, I get into all these isms in the past. I think today the world is more global and people are feeling more free, but the system is defying that sense of freedom and that's why we are in uh, deep trouble. Is the world, world more global? I mean, you see the people, rise of Yeah, I mean, of course, that's why. Yeah, of course. I, thought, I see that. But there are many people like me, like you, like many people in this crowd who want to live a great life and respect everyone. Do you respect everyone around you? I guess you do, no? What? We have to think about it. But I don't know. I, I just want to say, I have an observation and a, and a small question. Please. First of all, my, my first comment is that I just want to share a very small story about about um, we were put in touch by a mutual friend and one one um, one uh, once I tried to book to go to Venice Biennale and I had booked to go to Berlin by accident. He told me at six a.m. at the airport you're going to Berlin. So I could have gone back to London or I could have. I thought Steve is the only yeah. person in the whole world who I could say would would welcome me in his home and you'd ask what his home home is a person, home is a, a fact. Friends are. You know they're not linked to a location, but basically, you uh, it it was the best mistake I ever made. <laughs> we came and we discussed actually the artist first. I think we were talking yeah. about that in a, in a cafe yeah. and, the, and the book, which became this prior which, to the yeah, prior to the, the next. Was great. Yeah. But um, not only was Berlin welcoming because of you. I, honestly, you're probably one of the most generous, true, well, ge you. genuine people I have met, and I love Francesca. Thank and you very much. And was happy to meet them and very, very, uh, very glad. But also, um, I found also Berlin to be, there was something I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I liked it. And I just wanted to, to find out from you what is it, and I'm sure that about everyone here, that you know, you go to a city, you either you like it or you don't, you don't know, you can't quite place. There are factors, there yeah. are tangible or intangible. What is it about a city that for you makes you comfortable? And, and that doesn't make you comfortable. Yeah, well, I mean, this is going to be personal to you, obviously. And I'm very vocal about Berlin being the best city on earth to live in. And I travel a lot. I travel three to four months every year. I live in hotels. And I've seen many cities. And there's something in Berlin that is unparalleled anywhere else. That sense of freedom in that city. Probably this is what attracts me to Berlin. I mean, there's less control. There's less, there is no effort. Like CCTV, you go in Spain. The rules, regulations, uh, everything is controlled. <coughs> Even you, like, just this. Smallest example. Let's just talk on a human level. You go to a club here in London. You, the bouncers are all watching you. The cameras from everywhere. You can't let go. And Berlin, once you're in, there's no security. There's no camera. There's nothing. You're just let be. Is that true? Hundred percent. And I've tested this everywhere. Not only me. Everyone says that. You meet Berlin. You go to a jazz bar. You will find a 16-year-olds dancing with 90-year-olds. It has. It, it caters for everyone. And there is huge respect. In a, in a, let's say in a bar here, the bullies there, if somebody touches you, they go apologize 10 times for you. I, I mean, of course there are other sides of the city, I'm not I'm only speaking about that part. Then it's very relaxing, it's uh, not a plastic culture. It's, it's still, it has consumer society, but of course it gets, you know, it changes. But let's say here is a plastic culture, I can't stand that. You know, there it respects your time at least. That's what I want. But as, as I said, it's the control and uh, the sense of freedom. And I like that you said there are no mistakes in life. But if you're here, I just want to mention Olivier, which is just to... Uh, I wanted so much to write the story with Olivier. I fought the book, recycled it a million times, but I couldn't put it. But I have to say it since he's here. As I said, writing the book was not an easy process, but I was really conscious that I can only write out of love. So to write out of love, you have to relax. And relax, I took a plane, I went to Lisbon for four weeks, and I told my studio manager, find me, a flat by Airbnb in Lisbon, and the prices were atrocious. So we narrowed it down, and then after looking at tens, to two flats. So she told me choose this or that. Eeny meeny, okay, I go for this one. Okay, I go to Lisbon. I'm the first days almost crying, and the words are not coming out. Like damn, you know, and you already feel the deadline. You know, the month is finishing. Maybe after the final, after a week. I'm writing about the story of how Israeli soldiers stepped on my head in Jerusalem one night. 
and I couldn't remember the year. And if anything, you have to write a memoir. You have to be at least sure of the year, you know? But I remember it happened with my brother, so I called my brother, Paul. Paul, do you remember? It said 1999. Dude, you were in America in 1999. What are you talking about? <laughs> Obviously, he doesn't know the date. Okay, I can't remember the date. I asked my family, they don't remember, nobody remembers. Not even me. I go down, you know, walking this at night, starving, you know, because I forget to eat, you know, and dry. Go find a place to eat, and everything is closed around 1 o'clock in the morning, or 1.30, something like this. But then I remember there's this one bar, like, cave, that has probably two tables, probably five people are in it, it's full. I passed it, and it was open. I went straight to the valley and said, do you have any food? I said, no, I'll have chip. Okay, I'll take four of these or whatever. <laughs> and a glass of beer. Now, there was an African guy playing the drum and a guy from Japan or South Korea playing uh, flamenco. And, they were, and then I said, can I take the drum and play? Um, also drum. So I took the drum and played. And suddenly there's a vibe. And two guys, one of them is this guy behind me sitting, <laughs> was sitting on the table. And I heard them speaking French. And they were clapping and enjoying their moment. After maybe 20 minutes, his friend asked me, Ah, c'est très joli, tu viens de, where do you come from? I said, oh my God, I don't tell him now I come from Jerusalem. And he's gonna tell me Israel. And then I tell him no, I'm from occupied Jerusalem. I said, please, why don't you ask me what my name is? End the story. And I went into friction with him almost for 10 minutes. I refused, you know, to give in. Like, let me just have fun because it's torture every time the story. And then I said, okay, you want to know my name? My name is Steve Sabella, happy? And the other guy said, oh, one moment, I knew Isabella once in Jerusalem. His name, he didn't stop speaking. His name was Tony, and one night, his brother came in angry because the soldier had stepped on his face. <laughs> I didn't open my mouth. I said, okay, <laughs> what are the chances? I mean, and then I told him, what year was this? And he said, I still forget the year again. He told me what year it was, and then I got the year. <laughs> well done. <laughs> and no, the story doesn't end there. Huh? Now I ask him, where are you staying? Where, where, where was he staying? In the second flat, which I refused. I mean, call that crazy. I mean, this is the world I live in. So my next book is about the power of the mind and the imagination. Because I really believe reality and imagination are equal. And once you start to harness you know, the power of the mind, unbelievable things happen. You're still not convinced I liberated myself. <laughs> No? Never mind. Okay, talk about it. Okay, great. Which is dream and which is reality. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'm not convinced, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anybody? Questions? Ask him tough questions. Come on. Go. Sydney. Um, you mentioned in one of the extracts about um, the voice of Palestine, the voice of Palestinians being silenced by right. Israel and their discourse as being one of war. Um, and given that this is a memoir and the role of your voice coming through in that book, and I just wanted to ask where you see this book in terms of voice, in terms of mm. this conflict. I see it in terms of my voice, it's my story. But you know, we also know speaking uh, about one is about speaking about others. I mean, you can read the novel from Brazil or Tokyo and still find yourself in that story. So that's why I was very careful when I, well, careful when I wrote this story, not to load the reader with emotion. I just told the stories and let the reader develop the emotion. So nothing you feel like this, you know, thing like that. This is the story and you make up your mind. I stated, as somebody said, uh, I stated my case, you know. <laughs> yeah. Did, did I answer you? Yeah, and I just, um, just perhaps in terms of, do you see any link or any, is there any, do you think, perhaps political motivation, just in the sense that mm. because Israel to you is this silencing force in terms of voice, is there any element of rebelling against that in this moment, no. or is it just... It's not rebelling at all. It's, uh, I, when I felt liberated, I, typically I felt I want to share it with the world. Mm. If I manage to break free, maybe it inspires others. That's all I want. But then again, you know, I'm an artist, you know, I, I took it as a challenge. So I see definitely this book as an art project. I don't see it falling into literature per se. Who knows? It's not up to me to decide. I'm very vocal about that. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Please. Uh, my name is Shabi. Thank you very much for Hello, very interesting uh, talk. Um, what about other Palestinians? 
interested in artists? Do you have some that you particularly like, mm. or uh, you feel some connection, or you try to avoid them? <laughs> uh, did you, for example, speak to Elias Suleiman? No, actually, I particularly no, I don't. <laughs> but I have uh, many dear friends, for example, um, uh, I see come up a lot as a dear friend, and I write about him in my book. Mm -hmm. Hany Zorov, he's also mentioned in my book, very, very, because the, their sense of justice is unparalleled, you know. So, uh, they're true human beings, and I feel very much connected to them. And I do have many other friends, not only these, but these two I, I choose to mention. Yeah. And I chose by Elias Van Der the poet, mm -hmm. the writer, very much so. Is mentioned in the book. No, I, I, I'm a person, I converse with everyone, so I do have many friends who come from Palestine or artists. Yeah. But do you feel they uh, sort of share your uh, point of views or your way of how of the liberation did they go through? It's quite interesting what you ask me. I don't know, the artists, yeah, definitely they would, many of them would, but once while I'm writing the book, I had a talk here in London with friends. And the Palestinian person jumped at me and said, how can you claim you're liberated knowing what they're happening there tomorrow? I said, that's exactly what the occupation wants you to feel, not to never feel liberated. So if I feel liberated, you're angry, you should be happy for me, if anything. Uh, that's funny to see it. I can see rejection sometimes from the Palestinian side. But on the other hand, I also feel so much support, to be honest. Like many people follow what I do, and I get many times when I post something, like great feedback. Uh, it's funny because they see me as a symbol for something, but I, as I said again, I'm, I don't represent anyone. I present my views and my views only. Period. But the people can see whatever they want to see. It's the right, no? Do you consider yourself part of the new contemporary Palestinian art canon? Would, I would consider you ever have a, a course here don't on I don't categorize don't myself. Don't I don't categorize myself. I don't label. I don't like labels or classifications. I never worked with labels. Yeah. And the book defies all labels and classifications. If anything I'm sure of, I always say, Olivier, my name is Steve. <laughs> you know? I, okay? And that's the best identity one can have. You represent, and you know what? I, I didn't read the passage, I wish I found it because I got lost in my million notes in the month train. There's a passage about identity. What is identity? For me, it's a process, fluid. It changes every day. And uh, to be honest, it changes every second. Just of the light, forget the forest one, the light that comes to earth every day, there is, every second is different. There is no way on earth that the light particles repeat themselves, right? So how can we feel the same on a daily basis? It's impossible. I embrace change, and change is amazing, as long as you're true to yourself. Like, uh, that's why when people ask me if you exhibit here or there, I will exhibit, I'll consider anything, because my voice remains the same, and it changes, not because I change what I believe in, you know? It, ch it changes in a good way, you know, it changes, I uh, break structures in my mind. If, let's say, something is blocked, I, okay, I try to find out why. That's why in my work, people say, I build visual dilemmas, like mazes of the mind, and then once I sort it, I move on. And I, this creates upper consciousness, which uh, in a way is very healthy. You, know, you become more aware of your surroundings, people, justice, life. You know, I went to the cafe, I was shocked. I wanted coffee, I didn't know how to get the coffee. There are tazillion million posters on humanity, etc. children on slavery, on torture, on this, uh, free this country, free that country. <laughs> yes. So confused. So, but then it's easy to get this sense of justice if you really pay attention to your surroundings and respect everything around you. I think Alice has a question. Yes, exactly. My name is Alicia and I, first of all, I grew up in Berlin and <laughs> I really appreciate your view of the city. Um, I know, so you said you don't want to have text next to your pictures and yeah. artwork, but still I have a question. Um, what do all those windows do to you? Like, why did you put so many windows? Mm. Like, I get the trees, yeah. the roots and everything, mm. the roots in the sky and the clouds, yeah, yeah, yeah. but maybe you could elaborate a bit the story about the windows. Okay, this is what I wanted to do uh, through this, to, to, to divorce my art from my narrative, because it should that it can have a life of its own. I mean, I can tell you in the original context why I did it, but by any means, don't think this applies today. Are you interested? Okay. Yes. But back then, I used the window as a metaphor for me. I didn't feel I, like the way I look at the world and how the world looked at me. I felt I was neither here or there, not in Jerusalem and not in London. I was like in a third space, stuck between reality, between worlds. And I like to work with it. Uh, because notice some of the words, you don't, you don't even know if you're looking inside or outside, you know? And I put actually both of them together. That was the original context. And now please forget it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joe. Consultancy, so thanks so much. Oh, hello.
So yeah. I was just wondering if there's anything that you self censored yourself when you were if there was anything you left out mm. because of Very good question. Yeah, you know, that's why it took three years because you realize you have to be true to everything you want to say and you can't just. Uh, if, I, if the reader feels you're lying, you're going to lose the reader. A hundred percent I tell you this. And the readers are not stupid. So I was very careful not to write a truth there that comes from my real life, from, from what I believe in. This would answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> so no censorship, that's all I want to say. No, yeah, no censorship. That's what I yeah. <laughs> Yes, because they always tell you uh, you are you, you are privileged, and I really defy that. I lived thirty three years in Jerusalem, thirty three years, and you are treated like every other Palestinian, which is basically this is politically and uh, English like shit. It doesn't make a difference who you are, what you are, how much money you have, or whatever. Okay, if, in fact, my family struggled like every other Palestinian family to live, and you know how hard it is to live under occupation. Sorry, I didn't mean to sound like I was. No, no, I'm not. I'm just answering with open. Uh, no, I want. No, it's a good question. But as I said, it doesn't make a difference 100% if you live on the land, because obviously people feel they live under occupation even though they're not living on the land. So the question of liberation becomes here bigger than we think. It's not only the land, it's the mind. And if people, Palestinians live somewhere else and they're under occupation, so we, we have a problem. That's what I want to say. So it's legitimate. To, I mean, I have definitely come from Jerusalem under occupation, so there's nothing to say. I really believe the occupation of Jerusalem is horrible. Maybe let's put it this way. Gaza is beyond imagination, right? And uh, the West Bank is atrocious also. But in Jerusalem, it's also beyond imagination. So it's just the, the all, I want to say the bad word, it's just different levels of shit. <laughs> okay? <laughs> yeah. Okay, can, can I redirect and talk about art? Yes, Artistry? please. Artistry? Yes. Um, my question is. Um, now that you've used image and yeah. you've used words, right? Is there a difference in the process of creating with image and creating with word? Veronica, Sister Veronica says, yeah. don't paint icons, I write them. Yeah, so I write them, yeah, even though it's on. painted, right? Mm -hmm. There is, I mean, in history, there's the relation between the, the written word and the image and the transforming into image word. But I think, I think in your case, you separated them. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, yeah. I'm more interested in what, what, what happens when you as, a, as, a, as I said, I mean, maybe I said it in a different way. I find if you, the way you put words together, you create images. So it's quite challenging for me to, to work in this discipline, and I had to study a lot. I mean, don't get me wrong. I have I went to, uh, to every creative writing course universities have in the UK and America, and I've read all their uh, curriculums. Okay. So as an artist, the image is not. Yeah, because I wanted to write with clean, clean writing, lean and clean, and to, to do that is not easy. But I know the cons of creation, of creating something. Elimination. The more you take out, the better the something becomes. Let's say photography, the more you take out, the more you focus on the essence. Words, if you can say something with five words instead of 10, that's success, because that's how it should be. But to learn how to eliminate, that requires skill and knowledge, years of experience of reading on different levels. I did that on my own, and I'm very happy. And the day I finished the book, the next day I bought more books on creative writing. You know, <laughs> so that I felt tortured. I liked the process. I only work on things I love and like. I don't. But otherwise, it's not worth it. But I did suffer writing in this book not because of the writing itself, because after I anyway felt liberated. I when I had the scars, uh, I, you know, I had to reopen my wounds to write the book. And that was painful. And then stitch them again. And uh, the only way not to stitch them, because I almost reached the point of collapse, is with barbed wire. Imagine barbed wire, so that my skin becomes stronger. So I did make it very strong. Okay. Yeah. Questions more, Phil? Claudio. Etc. And also, 
answer to what she was saying, which I, I think it was more referring of the liberty you have when you have also, you know, money to travel and, you know, like your you know, elitist position, right? So for me, it's amazing that you found Berlin as your, you know, like your home, okay? Uh, me, I'm, after I've been living in London for almost 10 years, yeah. if I would have to think where to go, like yeah. all of a sudden, I kind of miss my country. I feel the difference when I go there. Yes, there are Italian people in London, yeah. but when I go in my country, I feel completely at ease. Do you know, there is my way of thinking, my okay. way of speaking. My, so I feel there is a difference. So if there is any trick to actually find what you found outside yeah. of your country, that would be great. I mean, I find myself lucky, really, really lucky to have found this uh, place at, at this age. I, I speak with Kamal, Kamal Bulat lives in Berlin. But two months ago, while walking uh, uh, one of the streets, and he says almost the same thing. He said, it's the best city he has ever lived in, and he's in his 70s. And he uh, he's, feels very lucky to have found that city. And I feel very lucky that I have found it earlier. Why I found it? I don't know, maybe again, this imagination story, I had to create this reality and be there, you know? Well, but I also like Lisbon very much. Huh? Yeah, I'm enjoying you there. Yeah. yeah. I think once you like every place, everywhere, you're yeah. totally yeah. I, That's true, no, because no, when my daughter finishes high school, my plan is to not to live in any city more. With, I would live in every city three to six months. So I would live in New York, live in Tokyo, live in uh, yeah. Sydney, and then I live Shanghai. Yeah, Shanghai, they're all on my list. Yeah. And for many years I would do this, because my, maybe, maybe my art allows me. So I can just supplement anywhere I want without worrying about uh, connecting the flat or anything. Just go and live. And the career continues anyway, wherever I live. So that's great. That's freedom, no? That is freedom. <laughs> freedom. Yeah. That's not freedom. Any more questions or discussion, comments? Yeah, one more. Maybe, um, I mean, you just mentioned that you would want to move and live in yeah. so many different places. But don't you find that every time you move to a new place, you move new people, you have to introduce yourself. Yeah. And then again, you're Steve Sabella, and everybody will be like, oh, that's an interesting combination of this. Yeah. So where do you come from? So yeah. every time you have yeah, to like, yeah. confront True. yourself, like mm -hmm. uprooting, but then again, you have to I mean, yes. explain where you come from, right? True. See, it happens to me even in Berlin. What are you talking about? I mean, yeah. it happens everywhere. But and, and now I'm actually more relaxed about it because it is really the story of my life. I would get bombarded sometimes 10, 15 times a day about well, why your name is Steve and why Palestine, why Jerusalem. It's so much ignorance around, it's beyond, beyond. Because you say Jerusalem, they assume Israel. And I say, they, nobody in, uh, there is, it doesn't exist in the consciousness of people that Jerusalem is Palestine, you know? And then they think, they think I'm Israeli. So I define myself by what I'm not. But I, I'm not Israeli. But then why your name is Steve? And why is it like that, 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 Okay, I um, wanted to say something about, yeah, today when people ask me, I say I come from planet Earth. It's a very meaningful, it's a planet Earth, you know, because I, my theory is if you just be yourself, say, you know, your name, whatever, I defy you. If I like you, you like me, in five minutes, I will want to tell you where I come from in an organic and natural way. Why, you go everywhere, people will bother you, where you come from? I mean, let's get to know each other first. And then you will find, you know, we all have a story. I mean, what is coming from? That's what I to say. If I was born, I lived 10 years in Jerusalem. I'm, I'm 55. I have to say I come from Jerusalem. Okay, clear. Palestine, but okay, he lives in New York 40 years or 20 years here. So let's just be real. And reality means, you know, let me say where I come from with my own words. And don't assume, project on me what you, where you think I come from or what I believe in. Short story, I was in a bar, in a, not a song contest, in a, in the bar in a song contest in Berlin. An idiot guy comes to me. He knows, no, I told him, you know, I come from Jerusalem, Palestine, 100%. Oh, I was in Palestine and this and that. Great, 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 you know. And then he tells me, I know, I'm jamming, I'm listening to music, you know, wow, nice. I didn't, wow. I didn't know that Palestinians could like such a music. Like, he's, what, mm. what do you mean? I mean, could, how do you know about Palestine or Palestinians or music? I mean, what do you mean could like? like I, could, I couldn't like trans music? In his mind, wow. But as soon as can like trans music, I mean, come on, do it, you know. So this is what you have to deal with. So today I'm, I manage better to, to escape these things because then it mirrors the people's ignorance, if anything. Yeah.